in a series on God's beauty and how that beauty affects our beauty. So we're talking about some beauty tips. I'm not going to tell you how to curl your eyelashes or anything like that. You can go on YouTube and find some great tutorials this morning, I'm sure. How many of you ever looked? No, I don't admit that if you've ever done that. We are concerned about our beauty, though, aren't we? We're concerned about the way we appear. We're concerned about how people find us attractive. And even though we might say we're not concerned about that, we probably have some degree of concern about that. Not sure that it would be healthy to not. But our beauty is not superficial. As Christians, our beauty comes from who God is, and that's what our series is about today. Now, first and foremost, did you know that the feet of those that carry the gospel are what? What are they? Someone knows this piece of scripture. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, what are some things that make your feet beautiful? And so today I'm going to do a little lesson. I'm going to take off my shoes and I'm not going to go through all that. Right? <laughs> we don't want to see my feet. Feet can be some of the ugliest things. And yet the, the Bible says that they can be beautiful. If you bring the gospel. I want you to just tuck that away and take that with you today. No matter where else this message goes today, remember that those who bring the gospel have beautiful feet. Today we talk about God's power. We talk about a lot of things that God has and is. We don't necessarily tend to think of power as being beautiful. Why is that? Because what we see in power is a, it, it represented in the world is actually a very ugly thing. You've heard the saying that power corrupts. And power is something that originates in God. So how could that possibly be true? How about people corrupt? People. We can corrupt just about anything that is godly and beautiful and turn it into something ugly. God's power in and through our lives is beautiful, but it's not our power. Now, I love this scripture from Isaiah 42. It has a lot of beautiful imagery in it. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, right? It talks about us mounting up with wings like eagles. Even youths get tired, it says. That's a sort of a funny word to use in our culture. Those youths, right? But they even faint. They grow tired and weary. But God's strength, God's power is what renews. There's so many aspects of how God's power works in and through our life. And we almost would say that, well, if God has all the power, why isn't everything perfect? You can look at Jesus walking on this earth. And he chose 12 disciples, and one out of the 12 chose to not follow him, in fact, but to betray him. How powerless does that look? Jesus couldn't even influence that one out of the 12 and keep that one. But that's not how God works. We shouldn't be surprised when we are acting in God's power and see other people turning and leaving. But that doesn't mean that we're not walking in God's power. It doesn't mean that we're not walking in God's beauty. Sometimes, even those things, that power scares other people. But before I get too far away, let me just sort of recap Isaiah 42 by saying that it reminds us that God is everlasting, creator. He does not grow weary. His under, God's understanding is unsearchable. And what does that even mean? It means maybe that you can't understand God's logic sometimes, sure. But God's decisions and ways are actually just beyond our understanding. But we get from Isaiah 40 that God grants power, strength to the powerless, it says, and renews the strength of those who wait on God. God's power is actually beautiful, but it's our acting autonomously that's ugly. So what keeps
keeps us from being fully obedient. Fully trusting. Remember, God's all powerful, right? And yet we have the leeway to be disobedient, to go our own way. What is it that causes us to give up hope knowing that God is all powerful? When we can keep hope, when we know that we can fix things, but we give up hope when we don't think we can, we have forgotten that God is a God of power. Our God of power wants to intervene. God is the God of the impossible. Jesus heals the sick, cleanses the leper, even raises the dead. Surely God can do what is difficult. God parts the sea, defeats armies, turns day to night, creates all that we see. Surely God can do even the impossible. Just as Isaiah reminded Israel, we are reminded today of God's power. Whatever the problem, whatever the difficulty, God is all-powerful. God can do the work that needs to be done. Now before I kind of put some bows on this message for us today, I have a couple of things I want to show you. I want to see if you can identify what these might represent.
I love the heart of the people that really taught me what it is to follow Christ. And uh, are you washed in the blood? <laughs> All those good things that stick with me today. But these three signs really mean something for our lesson today. Quiet, shelter, and this last one with the three crosses. That's scary. The three crosses, this is going to represent the trail marker. Now on the trail, you'll have distinctive markers. If you go out on the Appalachian Trail, there's distinctive markers that you're looking for to make sure you're right on the right one. And I, it's been a while since I've been on the Appalachian Trail, but I can remember going out and you'd see white dots and blue dots, and then you'd see no dots. Lots of spaces where there are no dots, and it would frustrate you. But today, from Isaiah, for sure, reminding me of the beauty of the eagle and nature and running and not growing weary and walking and not fainting, it brought me to a place of hiking, an analogy that I've used many times, but I've never gotten this far in this analogy. But I know that there's something here for us in Isaiah 40 and in Acts 1.8. And here's what I want to tell you about the power of God for your life today. God is the God of the impossible, is He not? We behave as if He's not sometimes. But let me tell you, as difficult as it is to own in the midst of trauma, catastrophe, some of the worst things that you can go through, the degree of difficulty does not dictate God's decisions. The degree of difficulty does not dictate God's directions. And the degree of difficulty does not make God desperate. And it shouldn't make us desperate either. The degree of difficulty doesn't make, doesn't dictate God's decisions. Don't let the degree of difficulty dictate your discernment. We have to discern and hear from God. Some of the things in response to that question I sort of asked before, what keeps us from fully obeying, what keeps us from fully trusting, difficulty in our human nature. We stop discerning sometimes when things are difficult. But here's the reality. We need to stop talking and listen. Have you ever been out on the trail and gotten separated from the group of people that you're supposed to be with? Has that ever happened to anybody? Any hikers out here? Any people that have experienced that? It's actually really frustrating. It, it's sort of, in a strange way, it reminds me of the time before cell phones. <laughs> You know, it's like, these people are out here in the world somewhere, and I've got to get to them, and I cannot contact them, I have no idea. And a lot of times when you're hiking out in the wilderness, you don't have self-reception, so how appropriate of an application, actually. But sometimes when you're separated, if you just stop and listen, you can find your way back to the trail and to what you're looking for, for the people in this case, we can hear God when we stop. Campgrounds have quiet hours. On our path and on our journey, we sometimes forget that we need to have quiet hours. We want to do all the talking. Our prayer time is full of our requests. Life is about us telling God and even others what we need. And sometimes God says, Listen, listen, just stop, stop moving. The degree of difficulty does not dictate God's directions. God doesn't say, I had a great plan, but never mind. We have to make sure, though, that we are waiting for God. In Isaiah, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. In Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the 
earth. There it is, that witness part of it. The gospel. You ever tear up your feet on a hike? Basically, every time I go out on a long hike, my feet are blistered, killing me. Something is happening. We have to sometimes wait on the Lord. Wait. Not be in such a big hurry. You ever heard this? I know you have. Your parents told you long ago. I was taught this. When you're out in the middle of nowhere, even when you're in the city, if you get separated and lost, what are you supposed to do? I always hated this advice. It is, I knew it was right when I really think about it, but it's, I, it's so hard. You know what it is. Stay where you are. Stay right where you are. Don't keep going. Sometimes, when things are difficult, we want to keep going. We want to make our own decisions. But difficulties don't change God's decisions. We need to discern what they are. We need to stop and listen, hear His decisions. And we need to understand the directions. We need to just wait. We need to stay in our shelter. We need to take shelter in God and know His direction. Man, I hate getting lost. It is the worst. My dad would say he never gets lost. Anybody finish that statement? <laughs> never gets lost. Just doesn't know where he's going or something like that. <laughs> to get lost is painful. I remember that happening as a kid. And I have a really good sense of direction, right? But when you get lost and you don't know directionally, north, south, east, west, and you don't know where you're at, you don't know where you're going, it's scary. I love this old Andy Griffith show for Barney, Wilderness Explorer. He extraordinaire. And he goes out and he's I can't even remember all this scenario, but he is he's the man. Well, it turns out Barney gets lost and Andy has to come to his rescue. And Andy is so gracious. It's just like what God does for us. God sets it up for us so that even though we're lost, we can still achieve something great. And that's what Andy does. I think, you know, he he set up some snares or, or got some things and put them in Barney's horrible snares and all these different things that he had to do. And before you know it, he even had it so that he was able to guide him back without Barney knowing that he was guiding him back. And God is so gracious to us when we get lost on our trail. But sometimes we have to remember just to stay put, to listen, and to shelter in place because we can trust in God's power. The degree of difficulty does not make God desperate. And it shouldn't make us desperate either. God's not saying, how, who's going to come to my rescue? What's going to happen next? God's response is distinctive. And it's different. And I know that might sound intangible because it's a statement about nothing, isn't it? I'm not talking about a certain situation. I'm not telling you exactly how to apply it. But here's what I do know. that The, the degree of difficulty doesn't change God's decisions, and it doesn't make God desperate. Sometimes we get desperate when we don't get a response, when the answer isn't what we think it should be, and we can start to make decisions all by ourselves and live in that world as if it is God's will. I think we should be reminded today of how God changed the world for us. How many people did God need to change the world and give us forgiveness and freedom and grace and mercy and salvation? How many people? Actually, none. We might want to say 12, but the reality is He didn't even need 12. Jesus just chose 12. We don't know the logic or why. But through those 12, how many people in the world have been saved now today? Through Jesus and those 12, all of us. 
They didn't become desperate as a group of 12, and then 11, and then 12 again. They didn't say, let's take things into our own hands and make our own decisions. Let's figure this out together, and then we'll do that. What did they do? Acts 1.8, and the story of Acts tells us all about it. What did they do? They went someplace. They took shelter. They stayed on the trail. See, this is a trail marker. If you see this, this is the way to go. When you're on a difficult path, and you don't quite know where to go, look for the trail marker. Look for the cross. Look for the cross. In Acts, we know that the disciples went to where? The upper room. And what did they do? They waited. And then God's response was distinctive and different. It wasn't like things had been done before. It was different. If God can change the world and choose to use 12, I think we are okay today. God plus one, as they say, is a majority. If we become lost on the trail, don't simply follow any path, any path out of desperation. Don't panic. Stay calm. Do what is right. Follow the trail. So today, as we are reminded of God's power, His ability to intercede in the impossible, let's remember that we need to listen and have quiet hours. We need to take shelter in Him and make sure that we're staying on His path. Amen.